compared to the joys of knowing you. Your beauties and your majesties are far beyond compare. You've won my heart, now this will be my prayer. Take the world back, give me Jesus, you're the treasure.
Let's all get to do this one more time.
to Jesus. Just let it out. This is the last one. This is our last service before tonight. Just let it out. Come on. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. You're all we need, before the Lord.
That's the cry of my heart. And I know, Lord, that my young people are probably tired of hearing that song. But I don't think you ever get tired of hearing one of your children say, God, I need you more. Lord, I recognize that I'm weak and frail. I'm nothing without you. And I'm learning more and more, Lord, as the days and the years pass by that though I'm nothing without you, <laughs> I don't understand it, but I can do all things through you. And Lord, and Father, that um, you created everything out of nothing. And all you're waiting for is for some of us just to get out of the way and to become nothing in our own eyes so that you can do some great things through us. Lord, in this session this morning, I ask that once again that you'd speak to us. I ask that you'd plant vision. Lord, vision inside of us, Lord, that when we go back to our respective cities and homes, 
Lord, that we would have a passion and a vision, Lord, for our schools and for our communities. Lord, if this conference ends with this civic center, then as far as I'm concerned, we've late wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. If all this is going to be is just a memory that we put into our diary of something that happened in the month of July of the year 2000, then I'm not interested in ever doing this again. But Father, the fruit of what is really taking place this week is yet to be seen in the next coming months and years. And so, Lord, I ask that you would solidify some things this morning and help us, Lord, to uh, hear the word of the Lord. Father, I ask that you would burn it in us today. In Jesus' name. Musicians, just stay with me as everybody continues to go back to their seat. Pastors, listen carefully what I'm about to say. Young people, listen carefully what I'm about to say. I received the Lord when I was 16 years old. I was a Catholic, had no idea what I was doing in a Pentecostal church. And when I got saved, I had an immediate desire to become a preacher, but the Lord did not call me until three years later. And as a young man, I had great ambitions and great desires to conquer the world for Jesus. I wanted to be what I've referred to as a giant killer or a world changer. And I wanted so badly for my youth ministry to grow. And I remember when I took my first church, which is only about 25 minutes from this building. It was my home church. We had about 25, 30 teenagers, and I remember I would come in the morning, every morning, 5.30 in the morning, and I would pray, and I'd ask God to grow our youth ministry, and I remember thinking, boy, if I ever had a youth group of 100 young people, then I'd be happy. Then I would have arrived, I'd be happy, I'd be the man. And after a few years of steady growth, we reached 100 young people. Listen to me. I wasn't happy. And then I came to Brownsville shortly, about eight years later. This October would be eight years ago I came to Brownsville. Started with a youth group of 70. And again, I remember thinking, if I just had a youth group of so size, you know, I'd be happy. 
We reached 100, I wasn't happy. We reached 200, wasn't happy. Reached 300, wasn't happy. Continued to grow to numbers beyond that, which I don't need to go on beyond that. We did conferences, have thousands of teenagers come. Can I tell you something? Conferences don't make me happy. Let me tell you, the things that you aspire for are nothing more than an American dream many times. Listen to me, youth pastor. Success in the ministry is not going to make you happy. I was thrown into a, success of, uh, a successful arena. Nobody knew who Richard Crisco was five years ago. Nobody knew who I was. And all of a sudden, everybody was calling me, wanting me to speak at conferences and wanting me to fly here and there. And I tell you, I don't give a rip about any of that stuff. I canceled every conference this summer that I was supposed to speak at. I got people mad at me all over the place. You know why? Because conferences won't make you happy. Let me tell you the only thing that will satisfy you, young people, and don't you ever forget it. Let me tell you what the only thing that will satisfy you, youth pastor, and that's an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that really matters to me. I don't give a rip. I don't give a rip about what you think about me. I really don't care. Some of you probably see me fluting and flancing around here on the platform. You think he just is the biggest show off in the whole wide world. I could give a rip what you think. I'm not showing off for you anyway. I'm just showing off for my Jesus. But you know, let me tell you something. It's all about wanting more of Jesus. Want more of Jesus. And this morning, when I left here last night, the Lord began to deal with my heart and change my direction for this morning. And this morning, I'm going to deliver a message that's going to nail 95 to 99 percent of you this morning. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I was up till three o'clock this morning preparing, and um, I want you to give me a good ear. If we could begin to turn the house lights up a little bit, but before I come. I want to ask a couple of teenagers that I just recently met come and share their testimony. I'm so excited. I guess it was probably the third week in April, if I recall correctly, I started getting these emails. I mean, just people sending me emails about this revival that broke out in a public high school in Mississippi. And as I'm reading these things, my heart's burning. And then I started reading these newspaper articles that people started sending me and these magazine articles. And about two weeks ago, I came across an another one. And as I read the article, my heart burned. And I said, Lord, if I could get one of those teenagers here to talk to their peers about winning their, soul, their school for Jesus, whoo, what could ignite? And so I just had Jan call, said, Jan, just see. And I believe that Brandon and Carrie are here by divine appointment. These are a couple of teenagers that are uh, in a high school at Mississippi. And they did a volunteer assembly. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but they did a volunteer assembly. 90% of the school showed up. The power of God fall, fell, and they had to cancel all the classes, I think, that day. I believe that this is the year that God's wanting to do that a thousand times over across America. I just believe that with all my heart. And so with great expectancy, excitement, and respect, and joy, I want you to welcome to the platform one of my new friends in Jesus, Brandon, as he comes at this time. Make him welcome this morning. How's everybody doing this morning? <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, God has moved my life very fast the past several months. And it didn't take much for us teenagers to get up and say, hey, we're tired of sitting down, going to our FCA meeting every Wednesday morning and say, hey, we're going to do something for God. We're tired of just sitting here. We can all do that. 
and we're going to share more about that with you a little later on. But a very good friend of mine has had a laid on her heart to give her personal testimony to every one of you. She has a lot to say, and she's going to say it. God is going to say it through her. God laid this on her heart. And I was once asked if I could find one scripture that would describe Carrie Ann Dale. It would be this one. Proverbs 30, 31, 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. <laughs> Carrie Ann, I've also often said, is the most godly woman I've ever met. I've often wondered about my future, what kind of future wife I would have. And I don't know who that is or where she is. All I know if once I meet that person, she'll show me as much of God's love as Carrie Ann Dale has shown me. The power of God pours through her. Every time I look at her, I see God's love. I'm sure you will too. So please welcome my best friend, Carrie Ann. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right. Can we turn the spotlight a little bit off? I want to see some people. Is that okay? Can you turn the lights down a little bit and lift them up or something? I want to see some people's faces because the spotlight's blinded me. Okay. This is something I've always wanted to do. I have their microphone. Okay. And everybody knows not to give me a microphone, but look, I want everybody to turn to the person on your right and tell them, boy, you look good. Okay, now turn to the person on your left and tell them Jesus loves you. <laughs> wow, I've always wanted to do that. Okay, um, so y'all think this conference is going awesome and like it's great, isn't it? Do you agree? <laughs> All right. This has been the best conference in my entire life that I've ever been to and it's like so wow, it's like awesome, it's like praise God. And um, Okay, you're gonna notice I am very bubbly. I guess that's what Brother Richard said. I'm very bubbly, and I'm just gonna talk to you as if you're my new best friend and everything. So, um, like Brandon said, I had a personal testimony to give to y'all, and basically, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna give my whole testimony, but basically I'm gonna try and tell you a little bit of my life and what happened at our school and what God's doing to each and every one of us. Do y'all agree that if you do God's will, he's gonna reward you with whatever and everything? Okay, I've been raised in a Baptist uh, church my whole life, Southern Baptist. I'm from Mississippi, okay? And I guess everybody expects me to talk like this or something, but I've grown up in a redneck high school my whole life, okay? Nothing against my high school, but it is a country-fied redneck school and everything. And you would never expect something like this, you know, that happened to our school to happen, but it did. I was baptized in March of 1993, I believe it was, because it was eight years ago I was baptized and I came to know the Lord as my personal savior. I remember when I was 10 years old and I remember when I first had the calling, you know, of Jesus, you know, to come into my heart and my dad, okay, my dad used to want to be a youth minister and everything whenever he was younger and everything. He went to ministry school and everything and it was like really awesome. And now he's not with Lord or anything. And so y'all be in prayer for me so that I can get my dad, you know, back to church and everything. But um, I remember my dad, he used to tell me, you know, whenever I was like, Dad, you know, I want to be a Christian. You know, I want to live for God. He used to tell me, do you know what Christian means? And I was like, no, but I do know I want to live for God. I love God so much, and he wants to come into my heart, and I want to live for him. He told me I couldn't, and I asked him why, and he said, until you learn what a Christian is and what it's going to take on your life, I don't want you to get saved. The very next minute, I went, looked it up in the Bible. I, told, I mean, looked it up in the dictionary, told him what the word Christian meant, and I said, can I be a Christian now? And everything, he laughed at me, but the very next Sunday, I went to my church, and I told him I wanted to be saved and everything. And two weeks later, I came to know Christ, and I was baptized. My whole life, you know, I've been scared to live for God and everything. When I was eight years old, I was sexually abused by my 16-year-old alcoholic and drug addict brother, who is now saved, praise God. And 
My parents have been married for 27 years, and right now they are going through a divorce. They had eight children together, and I have one half-brother. My dad has nine children. And we haven't been the richest family my whole life, but I tell you what, God has provided for whenever we needed him. And whatever we needed, God gave it to us. Um, I haven't grown up in a Christian family. Um, my family right now, my parents are going through the divorce, like I just said, and right now it is it's so hard, you know, in my life because last year when they first separated after 26 years of marriage was the most difficult thing for me to ever go through. It's like, oh wow, you know, my parents are going through a divorce. Oh no, you know, what am I going to do? And it's really hard. So I know some of y'all, you know, if some of y'all's parents are divorced, I know what you're going through or what you went through. And the last year, I have been supporting three people in my family. I've been working at Walmart Supercenter and going to school, trying to graduate from high school by supporting them. And also, I have gone through depression. I've been to the medical doctors, and I've been through the stage of depression. I've contemplated suicide several times in the last two years. My ninth grade year, I was anorexic. I had an eating disorder. It took me two years to get back and everything with my eating habits because I thought I was overweight and everything. It wasn't anything but anybody said, but I didn't feel comfortable with myself, but I thought. I lost 20 pounds in two months. My mama noticed it, and she's like, Carrie, what's going on? And she finally convinced me, you know, to go to the doctor and get fixed. And through all this, you know, I told my mama, like, maybe four months ago, I was like, mama, I want to move out. You know, I am fed up. I am tired. I want to leave. I am so tired of this. I can't handle it anymore. Like, have mental breakdowns. And she told me, you know, just try and hang in there, try and hang in and everything. So I continued to work and to continue to pay for my car note and help pay for food and uh, house bills and everything with my family. And through all this, God has been in my life. It has been so awesome what he has done in my life through all the things that I have been through my entire life. He has stuck right by me. Last year, I, um, I dated this guy. And, oh, 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 gosh, I thought I was in love. Oh, boy, my goodness. I was with this guy for seven months, my longest relationship, okay? And, oh, buddy, I thought he was the finest guy in the world. And I thought, you know, oh, I'm so in love. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. But let me tell you something. That relationship took me the farthest from God I have ever been away. And, and I tell you right now, it took me and him breaking up four different times in seven months to finally realize that I want a God in my life forever, and I did not want some relationship with some guy to pull me completely away from God. And for the past year, over a year, I have been so on fire for God. Ever since I broke up, he and I broke up, I have been so on fire for God. And I have that passion in my heart, you know, for Christ, you know, that I'm not going to let burn out. I love Christ so much. He has blessed my life, you know, and he is continuing to bless my life. I've had calling into the ministry, and I'm going to be um, a dramatic minister one day. And it's so awesome, you know, through all the tough times that I have been through, that God has still stuck right by my side, and he has been there giving me everything that I have needed. Not what, that, what, what I wanted. He gave me everything that I needed. And everything. I want a Toyota Tacoma. He didn't give me that. He gave me a Cavalier. So you see, he's given me everything that I've needed, not that I wanted. You know, God is just so awesome. Last year, um, I was not, I was voted into our FCA. What we have at our school is it's a Fellowship of Christian Athletes program. And in junior high, it was just like, well, you know, you're only part of this organization, you know, if you're all preppy and popular and, you know, it wasn't a Christian organization, although they called it that because it wasn't, it was for popular people to hang out, you know, and just say, oh, wow, I'm a Christian, you know, but I'm going to go next week, you know, I'm going to go drinking and stuff and everything. That's how it's always been. But last year when I was voted in as co-captain of our FCA, it changed my life. What was so awesome is, yeah, I, I knew that I had a passion for Christ, but I wasn't, still wasn't really living with him. It took that relationship to take me away from him. And, and then right after this guy and I broke up, 
you know, I mean, it still hurts, you know, that, you know, he and I were together and we broke up because I know that I lost Christ at that time. And I feel bad because I did lose my relationship with Christ. And you never need to lose your relationship with Christ. You need to stay with him and always know, no matter through the tough times that you go through, you need to always know that Jesus is right by your side. And whenever you need him, all you have to do is call upon him and he will help you as long as you ask. And what I was saying is like last year, and everything, all that happened. And this past summer, okay, I'm fixing to get into what happened in our school. Brandon, come on up here. All right. Yes, <laughs> Anyways, ma'am. Okay. Um, this is going to be very confusing for me, too, because we both have a mic and we're both talking. So if, I hope y'all listen to our story of what our testimony of what we are about to tell you. Because uh, you have heard all the speakers get up here and um, then saying, you know, go out to your campuses, go into your community, go into your preach to your co-workers, you know, go and share the ministry with people, you know, but it is so hard, you know, like what Michael Rowan was saying, you know, with the hard chair, you know, the commitment chair, you need to sit in that chair and you need to face the hard times. You need to do that and everything as a Christian, you know, we're going to get persecuted for anything that we do. We will, I guarantee you, you will get persecuted. You will get mocked by your peers and everything, but think of what Jesus Christ did for us. He died on that cross for our sins. We're going to continue to sin. I guarantee you that. But you need to continue to also repent of that sin and ask God for his forgiveness and live for him. But what happened with our school, okay? God, okay, right after this relationship and I, you know, after we broke up and everything, God started really, 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 really working in my life. I mean, he just started left and right, left and right, you know, talking to him, you know, and I've never been so on fire for God. And so what he did was... He gave me, he told me, Carrie, go out to your school two weeks before school starts at six o'clock in the morning and pray. So, you know how like, I don't know, every school, it's nationwide, see you around the pole in September of every year. So he told me to go out there two weeks before school started at six o'clock in the morning on my summer vacation and to pray for our school and pray for guardian angels to come and protect our school this past school year. He just knew that something was gonna happen in our school. So uh, me, I went out there at six o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, two weeks before school started. I prayed for our school. Second day, we had two people. Third day, four people. Fifth day, we had 10 people out there praying at six o'clock in the morning on their summer vacation. The next week, we moved it to 7 o'clock in the morning. And every day, the next week, we had 25 people out there praying on their summer vacation for our school. And, and then that continued into the school year. We continued to go out there in front of our school, go around our pole, our, CUR, our flag pole, and to pray for Christ. And some days up there, it would get all the way up to like 150 people, I guarantee you. And it was so awesome, you know. So what we did is we circled around our pole, we held hands, and we would each pray. And you'd squeeze the hand of the next person. And if they wanted to pray, they could pray. If they didn't want to, then they can continue in the circle. And we had like tons, like 150 people out there. So it's really hard to hear the um, preaching. So one day, somebody had an idea that we go in the middle of our courtyard, the middle of our school, where everybody stands and get in the middle of them or by a tree and pray so that they can see us living for Christ and that it would like influence them to live for Christ. So what we did is we moved to the middle of our courtyard, being afraid that we might get shot, but we moved into the middle of our courtyard and we prayed every Friday morning at 735 for a whole year. And from there, you know, God did miraculous things in our high school and everything. So last, end of January, we were doing, in our FCA, okay, it's called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. In our FCA, what we do is we, we have fellowship sometimes, you know, we're like chocolate milk, milk, orange juice, donuts, you know, cookies, all that other kind of stuff. So with this revival that happened, was one morning at the end of January, we were having a revival and I was, see, I want a new leadership team for this year. Instead of having co-captain, captain, secretary, treasurer, you know, parliamentary and whatever, we had just four leaders for our uh, team this year for FCA. We found out that worked a lot better for us. And what I did is every Wednesday we would meet at 730 and I would make sure that we had somebody giving a devotion, somebody there to speak, you know, and try and witness to people and tell them a story or a testimony or something. And that Wednesday, I knew we were having the, we were having the fellowship, but see, I didn't get anybody. I don't know why till, till today. I still do not know why I did not ask anybody or call anybody and ask them to come and preach that morning. 
and everything. And then the moment I walked into, we meet into the and meet in the band hall. And the band hall, okay, I'm gonna let you vision this, okay? It is a huge porta potty. I mean, it looks like a huge porta potty. I'm sorry, it's like it's it's funny, okay? But anyways. And so that's, this is where we meet, okay, every Wednesday morning. And I walked into there, and I saw people there, and I saw all the food. Oh, the food looked good and everything. And what I do is I get up, and I'll um, make announcements or something like that. And so I got up there, and then I was about to tell them to go get their food, but then all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, I want everybody to take out a piece of paper, a pen, and write down what your goal, or what your goal as a Christian fellowship is and what you would like to do to help change your school. I must have gotten like 50 pieces of paper from different people and everything telling me different ideas, you know, from saying, going up to person to person and um, preaching to them, you know, inviting them here and inviting them there. But one of the ones that really touched my heart was someone had written down on a piece of paper that what we do is we perform these skits in front of our school on what it's like to be a Christian because every year we have a group called the Students Against Drunk Driving, it's sad, and every year they used to get up before school would end, before prom, they'd get up there and they would basically, they would just perform dramatic drunk skits, you know, of this happened, that happened, this car wreck happened, that car wreck, and stuff like that. And I'd never seen it since I've been in high school because they hadn't been doing it in the last couple of years. So they had mentioned that, and I was like, oh, wow, you know, it's so awesome. You know, it really, it really touched my heart, you know, to be able to do that. So I went to one person, I went to another person, another person saying, wow, you know, do you think we should do this? Should we do this? And, and everything, and everybody's like, yeah, you know, we should do that, but we're going to get permission from the school board because this is a Christian thing doing during school because we didn't want to do it before school, we didn't want to do it after school. And then finally, I went to one of our co-sponsors um, of our FCA. His name's Coach Don Davis. He's sitting way back there. But, um, Say hey, Coach. Yeah, y'all turn around wave. and wave. That's Miss Judy and Coach Davis. Y'all turn hey, around and wave, wave to him. Okay. I went to him and I told him this idea and told him what the paper said. He goes, Carrie Ann, I'm the one that wrote that. I was like, really? He goes, yeah. I was like in shock. I could not believe it. And he was like, yeah, you know, I think we should do that. And they started telling me about SAD and everything like that. And, uh, and so, so we took it from there. It blossomed from there. When we got, I held meetings, you know, I talked to people. You can interrupt any time. And, um, You're doing five. Okay, we went to, I went to the principal because we thought we were going to have to go before our school board, present a proposal, get a, um, what's the word, uh, a piece of paper filled with a bunch of people's names on it. So, but yeah, that, okay, thank you. <laughs> We had to get. We thought we were gonna have to get one of those with like tons of people's names on it and everything. But when we went to our principal, thank God we have a Christian principal, and she said we'll worry about the school board later. We don't need to worry about them. I don't need their permission, you know. So. This was the end of January. Remember that. And she looked at her calendar and she's like, "Why don't y'all do it February 9th? And it's like, February night, that's two weeks away, and I, we don't even have our skits, we don't have any music, we don't have anything done. So we performed it on April 12, 2000, which was one, three days before our prom, that Saturday. And we had a meeting in our cafeteria, in our band hall, and we just had all these meetings. And we, I wrote a skit, it was called Repent. We also had like two catching um, skits, like it's called the chicken skit in the doctor's office. That was funny. And then we also had like the dollar bill, little monologues, you know, different kinds of skits like galore and everything. We all got together and we figured out these skits and what was so, oh gosh, y'all, this was so, so awesome and everything. Our very first meeting at night on a Saturday night, we held it at seven o'clock. I went to work 10 o'clock that morning sick and I worked till seven o'clock, you know, straight at Walmart Supercenter. If y'all work at Walmart, I'm sorry, but I mean, I don't. We'll pray for you. Yeah, we'll pray for you. <laughs> And everything because, I mean, it is horrible cashier. You know, you face a lot of stuff with the cash. If the customers get angry at you, something's wrong. And, oh, boy, put us through a lot. And I was sick that day. So, basically, I went to this meeting. I got there about 730, and I was sick, and we hadn't even started yet. And when I got there, y'all, this was so, 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 so awesome. You know, to see 10 teenagers in a house, all right, so on fire for God. It was like we knew people that were out at drunken parties, at um, getting high, you know, having sex, you know. We knew people that were doing all this. But what was so awesome is one person started telling one story about their life, you know, with Christ or telling a story. Then that was a person, like, stood up. Then the next 
next person stood up, next person stood up saying, oh, wait, y'all got to hear this, y'all got to hear this, wow, 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 you know, just praising God, you know, and I've never seen so many teenagers on fire like for that. God. It continued like that for almost an hour or two until we were all just standing up and praising God, shouting to the top of our lungs, a room full of 10 teenagers with no adult motivation in it. It wasn't a conference. It wasn't a youth camp. It wasn't at church. It was kids in a house praising God. I just want to add this real quick before I get back to the story. I like to change the subject a lot. Y'all might figure that out in a few minutes. Or if y'all talk to me, y'all going to figure that out. But, okay, I have been to a drinking party before. It was a birthday party for one of my friends. He turned like 26 years old, and here I am, 18, you know, but that's okay. And I almost tripped. Okay, and... <laughs> Okay, and okay, I went to this party thinking, okay, oh, it's going to be a birthday party. You know, he's going to have some of his friends there. It's going to be cool. Let me tell you, I learned enough in the 15 minutes that I was there that can last me a whole lifetime. I saw people passing out. I saw people getting drunk. I saw people trying to walk up two steps and falling and everything. And I've been to that. And then what next happened was a dude was drunk. He left when I got there. And when he came back, he came flinging rocks on everybody's cars, you know. Eventually, all these drunk people jumped on his truck, beat him up. They, the cops came out, took all them away, took away all the liquor, you know. And this is just what I heard because I left when the cops started coming. Oh, wow. Because I was like, I learned enough in those 15 minutes that I was there to last me a lifetime and everything and I don't know if any of y'all go to those parties I don't know how y'all can handle it because I can't and everything so I'm never doing that again but okay back to the story okay so what happened is we had these meetings we had these skits you know we had them all prepared y'all saw last night that song I mean the the skit that was done last night with Jesus and with the thief that song was called thief by third day our final uh, skit that we did we did a musical skit to that song of the thief um, walking down the aisle, and then with Jesus walking down the aisle, in the middle of the aisle, you know, eventually, and it was so powerful, oh my, but what was so awesome, you know, is it was really awesome, you know, see it done up here, you know, and they'd be like, oh wow, that's so cool how we happen to do that too, and so now y'all get to see, you know, basically kind of what we did, and so, um, okay, I'm very bubbly, sorry, and so, okay, so, okay, we had these skits, you know, we had them, we had them laid out, you know, we had them prepared, and everything, and we had them all in this night nice notebook and everything like that. Open up to John 14, Okay. Um, sorry about that. All right. And so we had to call, we had to give a title. We had a title, you know, what this was going to be called because who, a bunch of teenagers are going to come to just a bunch of skits combined to each other and stuff like that. So Ben and I, he's another leader and everything that um, helped do this and everything. We got together and we were typing up all our skits in the little list, you know, of who was going to play what, who was going to do what, and this and that. And all of a sudden it was like, what do we call this? And all of a sudden Ben comes out with the word truth. I was like, why call it truth? He goes, read John 14, 6. And that says, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is so the truth. You know, you cannot enter the gate of heaven except for coming through Christ. And so we called it truth. And up to this day, you know, we had tons and tons and tons and tons of people praying for us because we needed prayer because we did not know what God was going to do at our high school. We were scared, okay, getting in front, of, okay, in a non-air-conditioned gym. Okay, I hate to say this, but our school's poor. We are from Mississippi. Mississippi has one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the nation. We have our, Mississippi is like, everyone, like whenever Billy Graham Crusade interviewed our sponsors, they're like, this happened in Mississippi? You know, how can you believe something like this can happen in Mississippi? But I tell you what, Mississippi needed this to happen. And it was so awesome. The whole awesome. nation needed this to happen. Yeah, that's true. We all need this to happen. And um, we all need Christ and everything. But that day, we had people everywhere praying for us because we didn't know what Christ was going to do. We did not know what God was going to do. All we knew was that he was going to have us go perform an hour. Okay, yeah, right, an hour and a half. Perform an hour and a half worth of skits and, um, and musical skits, you know, to 670 teenagers, including and not counting teachers. And who knows, somebody could jump up and they could have pulled out a gun. They could have shot every single one of us. And I thought that would be me because I was playing Jesus. I'm the target here. 
Brandon was pretty nervous and everything. I mean, we all were nervous. We had pretty the, nervous. We had youth ministers there because we had them there to prepare, you know, like, okay, if something did break out, we had them there so that they can help us handle it. But let me tell you, on April 12, 2000, it changed my life as well as many others. We did not need those ministers that were there. We handled it ourselves. Our program... Whenever we were we set up, okay, we didn't have a sound system. Our sound system in the gym, oh boy, no, 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 no. It was just, it was horrible. You can't hear nothing. The acoustics were bad. You just, you couldn't hear nothing. So what we did is, you know, two churches came up and they said, well, we asked them, of course, but two churches said that they were going to let us borrow their sound systems from their church and use it and set it up. So we set up first period. And so we were in that gym from 8 o'clock in the morning till like 4 o'clock that afternoon, non-air conditioned, burning up. Oh, it was so hot and everything. And I'm almost running out of time, so let me hurry up. Okay, so what happened is everybody started coming in. Okay, we set up, you know, it was really neat how it was all set up. Chairs here, chairs here, bleachers, you know, our little area up here by the stage and everything. Okay, it was really cool. And so what we did was, okay, um, first period we set up, second period at 10 o'clock, everybody started coming in. All right, we had, it was all voluntarily. We announced it. They did not have to come if they, did, if they did not want to. We told them, you know, look, this is what we're gonna do. This is what you're gonna see. If you don't wanna come, you do not have to. We had some people that didn't come, but 90% of our school showed up, of course, just to get out of class. All right, wouldn't y'all show up at an assembly just to get out of class, get out of class work? All right, I do the same thing. I would go to some assembly to get out too, but when they showed up in this gym and they walked in the gym, they left a changed person. They walked in that, okay, some people may have came in there to laugh at us, which I know two people that came in there and they said, oh, I'm going to come in here and laugh at you, da, 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 da. But let me tell you, they walked out and they were changed and everything. And so they start coming in at 10. At 10.05, what we did is we started our skits. Ben, he's, I wish he could have been here, but he, came, he went up there. He started, you know, just doing his little chicken skit and uh, opening and then did chickens and planes and everybody flying around and jumping up and down, plucking and everything. It was really funny. It was just to get their attention. And so, okay, we did these skits. And when we did the part, the thief part, all right, it was one thing to be really nervous, but when we did that song, Thief, by Third Day, it, it really touched people's lives. And Brandon, I think you need to tell, let Brandon tell you what he, his viewpoint of being Jesus was whenever he played that part in the, uh, that song, Thief. Uh, well, see, the only thing difference between our thief that we did and the thief we saw here last night, we didn't have any special effects. I was the only person in the entire skit wearing a, a costume, and it was an ugly old brown robe I found up in the closet. That was my dad's when he played Simon or Siren. Well, I put on that ugly robe, and I was making my way down for the last skit, the thief skit, uh, the crucifixion. i never forget walking through that gym, seeing the people looking at me that were on the floor. And for some reason, uh, somebody told me, Brandon, we're too close. It ain't where it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be back a little bit more. We're going too fast. So I said, okay, and I fell down. Just on top of my mind, I fell down. So it like, looks like I'm dying or something. And when I looked up, I motioned to some people. And that's when I saw the tears in the people's eyes. I was like, oh my God, we've done something, haven't we? We have made news in heaven today. Praise God. And the funniest thing about this is I looked at four people in the eyes, just four. And I had about seven people come tell me, hey, you looked me right in the eyes. I couldn't get hold of it. And then my sister came and told me that about eight of her friends, different people, had told me, Brandon, you know, you look me right in the eyes. And so that was like 15 people, if I can do my math right, I've never been very good at math, but I think it's 15. And I looked at four people. And that's when I realized, hey, Brandon Smith wasn't in that room that night, that day, excuse me. The Holy Spirit came down, took me from that plane of reality, and he was in my shoes, walking down that aisle, looking at those people. And he made sure I had eye contact with every single person in that room, praise God. And this is, sorry, now you know how I like it, yeah. <laughs> and this, to me, this is exactly what happened. Acts chapter 4, verses 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. Shaken! And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. If that don't get your blood pumping, you better check your pulse.
Okay. Brandon's really, he's going to be a youth minister or something one day. I guarantee you that. He's going to be some type of minister. He's so awesome. If y'all want a new best friend, you've got him right there, okay? But okay. Anyways, after we did this, what we did is we did not plan how we were going to conclude all this. We did not know what God was going to do because I felt, you know, that God was going to do whatever he was going to do. The way that we're up here now, we didn't plan this, basically, not really. We just basically said, you know, God's going to talk through us. You know, we're just going to get up here and just ramble on and on until God starts talking. Right now, I think he is. But, okay, and so what happened is I went up there. We knew that I was going to get up there after we did this final skit, okay? We knew that I was going to get up there, and I was going to say something. I didn't know what I was going to say. I got up there, and I started saying something, okay? And then another person, you know, it was going to be Ben, but Ben wound up not coming till the very end of this whole thing. And a next person in our skits came up. There's 10 of us, and the next person, and the next person. And eventually, it was like 11:15, and people in our skits were still talking, and it was so awesome. It's someone from our crowd, someone from my uh, senior class. Um, her name was Rebecca. She came up to me while I was up there in the front, and she said, look, she goes, Carrie Ann, what if somebody out of the audience wants to talk? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me go talk to Ben, because Ben and I were leading this and everything. I mean, we were all leading it, but Ben and I, you know, was basically, I guess, kind of the final say-so besides God. And so I went to Ben, and Ben's like, no, we don't have time and everything. We're running out. We have 15 minutes left. Then another person named Josh Rivero, he's very spiritual. He's really awesome. He came up to me and he said, Carrie Ann, you know, I want to talk and everything. And then I was like, y'all wait up here for a few minutes. I went over, I sat on the bleachers and I started praying because I did not know. I can't, you can't tell somebody not to talk, you know, when Christ is telling them to talk and everything. Because once he tells you to talk, you better say what he has to, t has to say because he's going to talk through you. And so I went up and after I prayed, you know, God's like, no, He's like, you keep letting them talk. You don't end this until I say so. So I went up there. I stole the microphone from somebody. I don't even know who, because that's why I said I, microphones are my best friend now. But um, I stole the microphone, and I told them that if they wanted to talk, then to come down there where we were at, stand in line, and they could talk. Before we knew it, we had 20, 30, 40 people so far tears falling from their eyes coming up there to wait in line to talk about what Christ has done in their life and what they believe Christ is going to continue to do in their life. And by the end, within like maybe an hour, okay, this is like 1130. We're supposed to be over. Then those right before our first lunch, the bell rung. We maybe had five people leave and everything. They didn't have to leave. Miss Lee didn't. Our principal did not stop them. And they, they, we had hundreds, we had maybe 200 people waiting in a small little line and corner, waiting, you know, crying and everything, praising God, you know, just saying, you know, I am a Christian and I want y'all to know that, or I have been, I have been baptized, I was a Christian, but this today has changed my life and I want to say I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning. And at least 10 or, of those people were, before, were atheists, did not believe in God, did not believe in anything. After they came in that gym, they believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior. We could sit up here and we can tell you for hours of what happened. We could tell you everything that Christ did, but let me tell you, I wish we would have brought our video. Nothing that we're going to say is ever going to describe the power of God that we saw that day. Instead of using the ministers, teenagers were coming up to me, other people, you know, saying, come pray with me, come save me, you know, come help me, you know. And I went to the hallway, okay, it was so awesome. I saw like 10 teenagers on, the, on their knees praying to God, asking for forgiveness, you know, saying, God, I love you, you know, I want you to come into my heart. And people were coming up to me saying, you know, Carrie, I want you to help me rededicate my life. Carrie, I need some prayer. I want you to come help pray with me. And I'm telling you, that day I saved six people. And it was so awesome. I can't tell you how many people exactly in that day, in the five hours, instead of lasting an hour and a half, it lasted for five hours. And the only reason that it ended was because we had buses that came and school was dismissing and people had to leave and go home. It was hot. People did not leave for lunch. We had a few people that would leave but they came right back to see what God was doing. We had one person, he got up, and he is so funny. Oh, my gosh. If you get to know Josh Spears, he's so funny. He would go, he'd go run and go, amen. It was so funny, or hallelujah or something. And he ran, and he had to go get something to eat because if Josh don't eat, no, he's not a happy person. So what he did is he went to go run and eat, and he goes, okay, I went out there, and I 
choked down, I choked down a real quick lunch. And he said, when I walked back into that gym, he felt the presence of Satan outside and he felt the presence of God inside. And it was so, it was like, I'm telling y'all, Satan kept trying to get into our, in our, in our gym. You know, we had somebody almost pass out. We had another person fall on the floor crying and everything, but we would always pray whenever something like that happened. Satan was so angry at our school. Two weeks after this happened, five weeks, I mean, after five hours of all this happening and everything, we had people crying. There was not a drop. If, you were, if they were not crying, something must have been wrong with them and everything, because I don't believe I saw one dry face in that whole gym. We had people talking about suicide, you know how they contemplate suicide. I have a best friend, all right, that has tried suicide on himself five times. He has scars and everything, but let me tell you, two weeks after this happened, we had a crusade in Picayune that's like seven miles away from Carrier and the Picayune Stadium, and let me tell you, it was really, really awesome, and they had the call, you know, it was teenage night, okay, it was teen night, you know, they had pizza, okay, to draw teenagers, and I'm telling you, there's like a thousand, like 15 hundred teenagers there that got pizza and they had to stay there that was the whole deal you know that if they came and ate pizza and had coke and whatever they had to stay there to see all this and seven of my personal friends including the one that was suicidal went up during to that altar went down on the on the field and was saved that night so the seed that we were able to plant at our school blossomed in them. And now I know several of them still call me today and be like, look, you know, what's church? This happened at church. You know, they're on fire for God. And I'm not saying our school's perfect. I'm not saying that we're perfect. But what I'm saying is God's perfect. And what I'm also saying is that he used us in ways that we never thought we could be used. You as teenagers, you know, you may say, oh, I have this problem, I have that problem, and everything. You may say, you're going to make these decisions. Several of y'all made plenty of decisions all week saying, I'm going to sit in that chair. I'm going to go cast out the demons. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, you know. And like what um, but Donnie was saying, you know, the other day, he left you a challenge and everything to bring your Bible, wear Christian t-shirts, read your Bible to... Um, to pray, yeah. Pray at lunch, do this and do that, and everything. He left you a challenge. I'm telling you, take that challenge. You know, carry the torch like Michael Rowan said. Carry the torch into your schools, okay? If you've already graduated, go to college and go to college and share it. Go into your communities. Go, go to your coworkers. Do whatever and share the love of Jesus Christ because he's so awesome, and he will give you so many great rewards because look at us. We never thought, we never dreamt of being up here, you know, knowing that Christ is going to have us speak in front of 4,000 people. You know, that is what God did for us. Okay, I think Ooh, Brandon's yeah. trying. Go ahead. Let me interject right here. It's the last thing I want to say before Brother Richard comes up and gives his word. Ten of us spoke to about 500 kids, and the glory of the Lord came down on us. And now, think of what 4,000 of us can do. These are, think on, of that. Brandon. Do you want it? Come do you on, want Brandon. it? Philippians, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. That is so true. You can do anything that is possible if you have Jesus in your life. You trust him. You have faith in him. You live for him. And he will do so many things in your life as long as, if he knows that you're willing, he's going to use y'all. So what I'm going to ask y'all now is go out. Be serious about the commitments that you have made. Go out, live for Christ, and don't be scared. Amen. Good word, man. Give Jesus praise this morning. <laughs> what they didn't tell you, and if I'm not accurate, you tell me, the whole atmosphere of that school changed after that day, did it not? You would go down the hall and you would see Jesus loves you posters on the hall, just all over the place. Everybody's talk, everybody was talking about Jesus. Everybody was talking about what the Lord was doing. Let me tell you something. What God did in Mississippi, He can do in your school. Hello. How many of you believe that it's the will of God for revival to come to your school? So what's holding God back? Us. Us. That's the only thing, friend. I want to share with you for the next few moments, I've got 45 minutes, I want to share with you something the Lord spoke to my heart last night. I want you, all of you, I want the house lights fully up, okay? I don't care about the TV department or any of that kind of stuff right now. I want to see you. I want you to pull your Bibles out. I want you to get the notepads out and your pens. You're going to take notes for the very first time this conference. Can't believe it's the last session and I'm now just having you take notes. Get out your notepad, your Bible. 
I want you to I want you to take notes. I want you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. For the next couple of moments, I'm going to share with you from my heart a topic that 95% of you, if not 99% of you in this room, whether you're a youth pastor who's been in the youth ministry for 25 years or if you are 12 years old here today, this topic is going to deal with you. And this is the thing that we have got to overcome if we are going to shake our community, if we are going to shake our schools, this is what we're going to have to overcome. And I want to talk to you about a topic that I myself deal with, and that is insecurity. I want to talk to you for a few moments about insecurity and how to overcome insecurity and the reason why we need to. Let me tell you something. Every great man or woman of God has had to overcome the feelings of insecurity. Think through the Bible just for a moment. Moses was very insecure. Remember, he said, but Lord, I can't talk too good. Gideon, when the angel of the Lord came and said, hello, mighty man of valor, Gideon is in a hole shelling peas, hiding scared to death, hiding from the enemy. Esther, scared to death. And her uncle says, you don't realize that you have come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. Jeremiah, you heard it last night. He said, but Lord, I'm just a youth. Man and woman of God, all through the scriptures and all the way through history, I guarantee has had to overcome insecurity. And this morning, I'm believing the Lord is going to help us deal with it so that when we leave here this evening, and when you go home tomorrow, Saturday, whenever you go home and you start school or whatever, that, that the Lord is going to give you the courage and the ability to overcome this area that the devil wants to bind you with. In Numbers chapter 13, if you look at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1, I have the caption over it. It says, Exploring Canaan in my Bible. And it says in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land. Say, explore the land. He said, I want you to send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Now, what did God tell Moses to do? He said, I want you to take one man from every tribe, and I want you to send him into the land that I am giving to Israel. Did he not say that? He says, I'm giving this land to Israel. And he said, I want you to send 12 men for the sole purpose of exploring the land. I want, I want them to go in. I want them to see the landscape. I want them to figure out where the, the landscape. I want them to see where the cities are at, what kind of fruit there is, and where the water brooks are at, and where the mountains are, so that you can have a game plan of how you're going to take this land that I'm giving to you. And so you see in the chapter that he lists the men there, and then in verse 17, follow with me, in verse 17 it says, When Moses sent them to explore the land, he said, Go up through Negev and on into the hill country and see what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? See if it's good or bad. Um, what kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? Are, what is the soil like? Is it fertilized or poor? What are the trees like? Uh, do your best. Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. And it says that he sent them in to kind of scope out the area because God said he was going to give them the land. And so they send these 12 men in, but they come back, and they came back with a different assignment than they were sent with. Moses sent them to explore. Moses sent them 
to come up with a game plan and to, and to find the layout and put a map down and, and see there's mountains here and there's, there's a river over here we could go through and, 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 and all this kind of stuff. But they came back not with a map, but they came back with a negative report. It says when they came back in verse 26 to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land, and they gave Moses this account. Moses, we went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But, but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw the descendants of Anak and all these other descendants. And, he, and they begin to say, but listen, the fruit is, the fruit's great, the land's great, but there's a problem, Moses. We can't do it. It's too big. The people are too big. The cities are fortified. The, they, man, they, they devour everything in sight. It's just too big for us. But I love what Caleb did in verse 30. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with them said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said the land that we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great size. We saw the, the Nephilim there and the descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. And we seem, and I want you to look at this, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. They came back. God said, I'm going to give them the land. But they came back and said, we can't take the land. The people are too big. Let me tell you something, young people. Let me tell you something, youth pastor. Anytime you start to do what God's called you to do, it's going to be bigger than you are. And there's no way that you are going to be able to do it in yourself. If you could, it's not God's plan. Youth pastor, let me tell you something. For 10 years, I did youth ministry my way. I used my gifts my abilities, I had all of my plans, I knew where I was going, I knew how I was going to get there, I knew how I was going to accomplish it, and I knew I would never fail. Why? Because I never did anything bigger than me. And in 1995, God rocked my world, and he threw something in my lap which was much bigger than I was. And I walked around in fear and trembling, I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing! My youth group exploded! It exploded at the seams. I had teenagers coming in from everywhere. Couldn't even tell you, tell you, give you a good definition of who Jesus was. And I was scared to death. And I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'll never forget what the Lord said to me. He said, Richard, you don't have to know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. And listen to me, young people, if you dare to step out and believe God to do something significant in your school, I guarantee all your classmates are going to start looking bigger than they really are. Youth pastor, I guarantee if you step out and try to do something great for God, I guarantee the devil will give you a thousand and one reasons why it won't work. And he'll try to intimidate you. Now, my wife... My wife doesn't like for me to watch boxing, but I like watching boxing. I mean, after all, we're the home of R Roy Jones. Hello, come on. And, uh, you know, if, if you ever watch boxers when they go into the boxing ring, or even before they get into the boxing ring, you know, they're up there weighing on those scales, you know, and they're, they're, crowd, they're frowning down the other guy, and they're looking him down, and, you know, I'm beat you, man, and, uh, you know, and all this guy. You know what they're doing? All they're doing is trying to intimidate one another. If you play football, now I never played football. I didn't want to hurt the other guy, you know what I'm saying? 
I never played football, but you know, I, I know, I know what those guys do when they get down that line, man. They're looking at each other, they're going, I'm gonna eat you for lunch, man. You know, of course, not in those kind terms, you know what I'm saying? What are they doing? They're trying to intimidate. Let me tell you something, young people. The devil is out to try to intimidate, but he's not near as big as he wants you to think he is. In fact, in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 12, it might be 14, I always get those mixed up. It says that one day we will, that we will, that, that Satan will be revealed. He'll be exposed for who he is. And all the world will look at him and go, is that him? Is that little twerp? The guy that shook nations and held us in fear and intimidation for years? You know what, Satan is nothing more. I think of Satan as the wizard in Wizard of Oz. You remember the story? <laughs> How dare you come in here? And they go, ah, 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 ah. But then what happens? The curtain is removed and they go, what are you doing? Ah, I said, How you dare? You? You're a phony. Can I tell you something? The devil is a phony. You don't have to take time to look at it, but jot it down in your Bible. Colossians, now jot down your notes. Colossians 2.15 says this. Satan has been disarmed at Calvary. What's disarmed mean? You have no weapons. If I disarm you, you have no weapons. Let me tell you something, young people. The devil has no weapons. Is the Bible true? Y'all don't believe that, do you? Is the Bible true? The Bible's true. What's the Bible say? Look it up. He has been disarmed at Calvary. He has no weapons. You know what the problem is, though? Is in our mind, we believe he does, and so we cower down. It's kind of like, you know, if I was to go into a 7-Eleven, 3 o'clock in the morning, nobody's around. I had a big jacket on. I put my finger in there. I, I go up to the cash register. I go, you got a gun, man. Give me all your money right now. They go, okay, okay, don't shoot, man. Don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. He's going to give me his money. Do I have a gun? But he's going he's gonna to behave according to what he believes he believes I have a gun, therefore he, I have the power equivalent to that of having a gun. I'm telling you, young people, the devil's disarmed. Hello, I'm dismiked. The devil is, the devil is disarmed. The devil's disarmed. He has no weapons, but he wants you to feel like he's got a weapon so that you cower down in fear in his presence. I'm telling you, he doesn't have a tooth in his head. The Bible says that he's roaring, he's stalking to and fro like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. You know what lions roar? A healthy lion does not roar on its prey. A healthy lion, he stalks quietly in the grass. A healthy lion will stalk up on its prey, and before the prey even knows it, he'll pounce on it. Let me tell you, the only lion that roars, it's an old, worn-out, half-dead lion. This is, listen to me, this is how they work. This is how they work. They, a lion yeah, will have its tribe and lionesses, and they'll, fi they'll find a, 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 an antelope or whatever. Yeah, I can't do like Mike, man. Wasn't Mike funny the other day doing that little antelope thing? But anyway, that's not me, okay? I'm me, that's him. But those lionesses, those, those, those healthy lions will get on the far side of that antelope and they'll be out there, in a, the, the, the tribe will be out there on the far side. And then the old, wounded, worn out lion that couldn't, couldn't do a thing to that antelope, he couldn't catch it if he wanted to. He, after every, all, those, all those, the tribe is on the other side, He'd get on this side and he'd go, Rawr! and you know exactly what's going to happen. The antelope's going to run which way? Doo! 
right into the trap of the tribe. Let me tell you something, young people. When the devil roars at you, don't run from him. Run at him, because that's the direction he doesn't want you to go. Listen to me, though. The devil wants to intimidate you, because if he can intimidate you, he will rob you of your confidence. If he can intimidate you, he will paralyze you in your spiritual battle. I tell my young people, get your eyes off of the paralyzing eyes of Satan into the empowering eyes of Jesus. If he can get you intimidated, he will cause you to compromise what you know is right. If he can get you intimidated, it will cause us to accept and tolerate what under normal conditions we would never allow. If he can get you intimidated, young people, he will prevent you from accomplishing the will of God. Our problem is this, though. Too many times we try to cover up our sin of intimidation. And I say sin of intimidation because let me tell you what intimidation is. It's a lack of faith in the Lord our God. God says, I'm going to give you the land. And you go, I can't do it. I can't do it. God, they're too big. They're too big. They're too big. They're too big. Let me tell you what that is. That's sin. Because it's lack of faith. And anything that's not a faith is sin. And I'm preaching to myself today. Preaching to myself today. But see... We cover our sin of intimidation and insecurity by labeling it with godly attributes, such as, well, we just need to pray about it a little bit more. When in reality, our praying and waiting on the Lord is nothing more than procrastination and avoiding conflict. Hello? Because, boy, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Well, I, I don't think we ought to do it this week. We need to pray a little bit more. We haven't bathed this thing in prayer enough. It's a sin of intimidation. We're going to stay in our little, little clubs inside of the four walls of a, of a small room, a classroom, instead of getting out around the flagpole or in the, middle of the, in the middle of the courtyard or the school and saying, you know what, we're not going to let them intimidate us. We're going to pray right here. Yeah. Or we go, well, let me tell you where my, my, I'm, I'm going to, reveal my sin. I'm a master at hiding my intimidation and my insecurity. I hide it underneath the blanket of humility. Because see, humility is so spiritual. Everywhere I go, people talk to me all the time and they go, Brother Richard, the thing we love about you is you're such a humble man. You, I mean, you're the youth pastor at that Brownsville Assembly. I mean, your name's been, been exalted in, in an arena that between you and me, it doesn't belong in. And, 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 and oh, Brother Richard, you're so humble. You, you're just so down to earth, and, and you're not exalted and puffed up. And, oh, man, you're such a humble man. Can I tell you something? I'm not a humble man. I'm an insecure man that hides behind a blanket of humility. I'm not near as humble as I appear to be. But see, I know how to play the game just like you do. And I know that humility is a godly attribute. And so what I do is I blanket my insecurity behind humility. And you do the same thing. You do exactly the same thing. Much of what we classify as humility is merely insecurity and lack of confidence and trust in the Lord. A third thing that we, that we do in covering our sin of intimidation is we claim to be peacekeepers. Well, I just don't want to, I don't want to cause trouble. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want to stir up any trouble. I, I, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a peacekeeper. I just, you know, I, I love peace, man. I, I don't fight. I, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Can I tell you something? The Bible does not talk anywhere about being a peacekeeper. It talks about being a peacemaker. 
Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. See, listen to me, young people. Listen to me, leaders. At first glance, a peacekeeper looks appealing and spiritual, but it is totally unbiblical. A peacekeeper will avoid confrontation at any cost. A peacekeeper will go to extremes to preserve a false sense of peace. And I say a false sense of peace. Dr. Brown made a statement a couple of weeks ago that just hit me between the eyeballs. He said, Richard, in 1962, whenever they cast prayer out of schools and they said we couldn't pray anymore, why did we obey? Why? It seems to me I remember a man called Daniel who was told that he couldn't pray. Did he stop praying anyway? Let me tell you something, young people. If we want a revolution, it's going to cost us something. We say we want a revolution. We want to shake this nation. Let me tell you how we're going to shake this nation. When we hold, rise up in holy rebellion and say, I don't care what you say, I'm going to pray anyway. God did not call us to be peacekeepers. He called us to be peacemakers. A peacemaker will boldly confront no matter what it will cost him because he does not worry about himself. Instead, he is motivated by love and by a passion for Christ to establish truth, and thus real peace will be established. That we hide our intimidation, our sin of intimidation behind this, oh, I'm a peacekeeper, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Let me tell you something, Jesus stirred up trouble everywhere he went. Revivals and riots constantly accustomed, uh, uh, followed Jesus. Let me share with you a couple of things real quick. Number one, your opinion of yourself, young people, and youth pastor will determine others' opinions of you. Your opinion of yourself will determine how others will think of you. At the end of that chapter, they said, we were like grasshoppers in our eyes, and so we were in theirs. Let me tell you something, young people. You're never going to shake your school as long as you walk around as secret Christians. You're never going to shake your school if you go up to somebody and go, uh, um, John, um, I know that you probably aren't interested and, and I, don't wanna, I don't want to offend you or, you know, I, 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 well, I, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Let me tell you something, that's never going to do it, dude. Let me tell you one, something, big guy. When you put your big old Christian shirt on, you got your big old Bible you can find, and you walk down the hall, and you go, Jesus loves me, this I know. And you're under shame, and you boldly proclaim, I'm a Christian, proud of it. I know you wish you were too, big guy. But hey, 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 you just don't have the guts. You're too wimpy to serve my God because you have to flow with the go. You can't go against the tide. You're not man enough to serve Jesus. I'll tell you something, I, I, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I'm not against Catholics at all. I believe some Catholics will go to heaven just like everybody else. Some Catholics will go to hell just like Pentecostal Assembly of God and everybody else. Because it's Jesus, knowing Jesus is your Savior. But I, I grew up in the Catholic Church. When I, got, when I was 16 years old, between my junior and my senior high school, I got radically saved. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about radically saved. I, don't know, I do not know what the term backslide means. I can't understand people who turn away from God uh, and go back to the world. I'm sitting there going, that doesn't make any sense to me. I've never done that. Never done that. It just does not make sense. How could you taste and see that the Lord is good and then go back to your vomit? I don't understand that. But when I was 16 years old, I got radically saved. And when I went, I, I, in, in my junior, I was, uh, I was also into drama. 
a real big drama. I was into all the dramas, and, and you know, in, in my school anyway, at Milton High School, all the people in the dramas were a bunch of potheads and al alcoholics and all that kind of stuff, and, and I was right into all that scene, but I got radically saved and delivered bef before my senior year. And I remember I went back my senior year, and I was proud of what God had done in my life. He had set me free. I was unashamed of my, my testimony. I, I, sh I carried my Bible. I was very vocal with, my, with my, um, my salvation experience with Jesus. And I really messed up the whole drama department that year. Because, see, a drama practice, which you almost have drama practice every night at our school, because drama was a real big thing, and at drama practice, you always, you always drank beer and smoked dope before and during practice behind stage. I mean, even our drama director was doing it. Okay, in fact, the very first joint I ever smoked was with my drama director. Very first one. And um, it was just, it was, that's just the way it was. And I just really messed them up that senior year because they would be back there smoking their dope and, and drinking their suds, and I would walk in the side room, and they would go, oh, it's Richard, and they threw down their stuff, man. They'd throw it down, and, you know, and i go, hey, guys, how y'all doing? And just to have fun, honest, this is the truth. I've done this a couple of times. Just to have fun, I would walk out, count to 10, just long enough for them to pick it back up and walk back in. Ah, ah. Let me tell you something, when light comes in, darkness has to go. But if you don't have confidence in who you are in Christ, let me tell you something, you're never going to influence somebody else. you got to walk in there with a the confidence. I'm a child of the King. Jesus is on my side. Greater is He. I really believe greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. For most of us, that's just a coined phrase. But your opinion of yourself will determine the opinion of others. The second thing I want you to understand is this. You need to stop, and I'm talking to myself today, we need to stop thinking and saying bad things about ourselves. We need to stop being so negative about ourselves and stop saying what we can't do and who we are not. We need to start saying who we are in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The Lord showed me just a few months ago. He showed me just a few months ago that, that whenever we speak badly about ourselves and when we speak negatively about ourselves, that we are literally grieving the Holy Ghost. In, Prov in, in Ephesians 4, 29 and 30, and again, just jot it down, I have to fly because of time. But Ephesians 4, 29 says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Ghost. You realize the Holy Ghost is on your side? Do you realize the Holy Ghost thinks you're the most incredible thing that ever lived? Do you realize the Holy Ghost believes in you? And whenever you go, I can't do this, I'm no good at that, I just can't do it. The Holy Ghost is up there going, no, no. Listen, I'm a proud father of two of the most incredible children in the whole wide world. Ashley Crisco and Caleb, in my eyes, are some of the best teenagers and young people that ever walk on the planet Earth. My son, Caleb, and son, forgive me just for a minute, I don't want to embarrass you, but listen, my son loves baseball and he's incredible. He's incredible. He played shortstop this year for this team. He was the captain of his team. He made more outs as far as getting the other team out than anybody else. He had several home runs this year. I mean, the dude is great baseball player. But it, make, it hurts daddy's heart whenever he starts saying, I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't hit the ball as good as I want to. I can't catch as well as I want to. It grieves my heart as his father to listen to him down himself and say, I can't do it. 
What do you think it does to the heart of God when He has all these hopes and dreams and these purposes and these plans for you? And He says, I want to give you the land. And you go, I can't do it. I'm just, God didn't make me strong enough. God didn't make me enough ability. And God just made a mistake with me. Scriptures in Ephesians says that when you do that, it grieves the very heart of God. Listen to me, young people. The giant, it was not the giants in the land, but the giants in their minds that the ten spies could not conquer. Hear me? It was not the giants in the land, it was the giants in their mind that they could not conquer. We need to stop believing what the devil is saying. We need to stop sucking up the intimidating lies of the devil. Because what you speak is extremely important. Let me share with you what I'm talking about. Brandon, help me for a minute. Rwan, come here for a minute. <clears throat> Brandon, stand right here. Ron, stand over here. My young people have heard me share this illustration. I want to show you how powerful your words are. For purpose of illustration, Brandon's going to represent God, okay? He's going to represent Jesus. And Rowan, because she's redheaded, she's going to represent the devil, okay? Yeah. You're nothing like the devil, though, sweetheart. I want you to know that. Now, listen to me. How many of you realize, how many of you realize it does not matter what the devil says about you? You realize that? The devil goes, the devil says this. The devil says, you're scum. He says, you're no good. He says, you can't serve God. He says, you couldn't shake your school if you wanted to. You, da, da, da. He, you can't do this. You can't do that. How many of you realize the devil says that? I said, how many of you realize the devil says that? How many of you realize, how many of you realize it doesn't matter what the devil says? Now watch this. God says, you're incredible. God says, I have a plan for your life. God says, I desire for you to spend eternity with me in heaven. God says, you can do all things through me. But how many of you realize it doesn't matter what God says? You go, what are you talking about, Brother Richard? We talking about it don't matter what God says. All right, let me ask you this. Does God, does God say he loves everybody that has ever lived? Did Jesus die for everybody that's ever lived? Is it God's plan and desire for everybody to go with him in heaven? Is everybody going? No. God's word and desires alone is not enough. If it was, everybody would go to heaven. God's not going to send anybody to hell, friend. If somebody goes to hell, it's over the blood of Jesus. They send themselves to hell. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, and in a couple other portions of Scripture, it says this, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. Do you realize that you're not saved until you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? The Bible says that your sins are not forgiven until you confess your sins. In other words, you've got to agree with what God says. God says you have sinned, and because of sin, you're destined for hell. But I don't want you to go to hell. I died for you that you might have everlasting life with me. But it doesn't matter until you agree in the mouth of Two or three witnesses, every word will be established. Make sense? Now, listen to me. How do you talk? Do you talk God talk? Or do you talk devil talk? Because let me tell you something. You have people, you go to school next month, and you go, I can't do it. And they're too big. I'm no good. I can't serve God. I can't shake my school. Whose language is that? Whose word are you establishing in your life? Who are you agreeing with? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. If you talk devil talk, let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to confirm the devil's word over your life. 
And you're right. You won't shake your school. Whether you believe it or not, you're right. If you say, if you talk God, devil's language, and you go, I can't shake my school, it's impossible, you're absolutely right. You've established that in your life. But if you'll change the way you talk, and you go, I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care how big they look. My God is bigger than their God. I can shake my school for Jesus. You'll establish it in your heart and in your life. Give God praise this morning. Thank you, guys. We've got to stop thinking and saying bad things about ourselves. Richard Crisco, you've got to stop saying negative things about yourself. The favor of God is upon my life. The favor of God is on my life. And whether we deserve it or not, it's ours. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine, and I will not allow my words to forfeit what God is wanting to do in me, and you better not let it do that to you either. Every one of us, every one of us have to battle this. I battle this. Let me tell you what, there's, I, can't, I can't cover all my notes, but let me just share one or two things with you in closing. You want to know one of the reasons why we get intimidated? is because we compare ourselves with other people. Stop doing that, young people. Stop comparing yourself. And I'm the world's worst. I love Michael Rowan with all my heart. But buddy, you make me sick. He can do everything. I bet he even sleeps like God sleeps. I mean, I, the guy does everything. He can do the dramas. How does he do that, man? Just, I, he can slap preach, man. The dude can preach. Can he preach? And then the thing that really just kind of slapped me up beside the head is the guy can sing too. It's just not fair. And I look at this guy and I go, oh, that's where all my talents went. He got them. And I meet youth pastors every day of my life, practically, who are a lot more gifted and have a lot more abilities than I have. But let me tell you something, young people. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to be judged by their gifts or their abilities. I'm going to be judged by mine. 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 I don't have to be a Mike Rowan. I don't have to be a Jeannie Mayo. I don't have to be a Johnny Jernigan. I don't have to be a Bob Gladstone. All I have to be is a Richard Crisco. And too many times we get intimidated because we look at somebody else in the church or we look at somebody else in the school and they can lift more than we can, or they make better grades than we can, or they can sing better than we can, or they can act better than we can, or whatever the case might be, and we go, I can't do it. I'm telling you, you can't do it. Stop comparing yourself. Let me tell you something else, too. Stop getting jealous over other people's gifts and blessings. Stop getting jealous over other people's gifts and blessings. Some of you go, well, they were just born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Let me tell you something. If you're going to ever do anything great for God, it's going to cost you something. And if God's blessing is upon somebody's life, let me tell you something. They've paid their price. You don't know what the price is, but they paid it. They went through hell. You know the reason why God's anointing and raising up Carrie? Did you hear the hell that she's going through? Did you hear it? Did you hear about the molestation? 
Did you hear about the divorce? Did you hear about all that? Let me tell you something. That's not by accident, sweetheart. God's allowing those kind of things to happen to you because he's making you. We are made in the furnace and the fire of trials. And I'm going to warn you right now, young people, if you want to do anything great for God, it's going to cost you. You're not going to be able to do things that your friends do. When they're out having fellowship after church, God may call you to go home in the prayer closet. Hello. When they're out playing ball, God may have you out witnessing somewhere. If you're going to do anything great for God, you're not going to be able to do anything, everything that everybody else is going to have to do or everybody else does. It's going to cost you something. It's that chair of commitment. Jesus. Young people, if you're going to overcome this intimidation factor, I'm going to, I'm going to close with this. If you're going to overcome this intimidation factor, you're going to have to stop being afraid of failure. My staff will tell you the last two years, I keep saying over and over, I want to fail more. I want to fail more. I want to fail more. You know what? Most of us in this room do not fail enough trying to do something great for God. And so we stay in our little circle of security and we never give God an opportunity to show himself strong. Why? Because we're afraid of failure. We're afraid that if we fail, what will people say? If we dare have the guts to say, I'm going to win 100 people this year at school, and if we don't do it, what will people say? You know what? Most of us in this room are more afraid of failure than we are of God. God says, I want you to do this, and you go, oh, I can't, God. I'm afraid I might fail. You already did fail. You failed God. Young people, I'm learning more and more every day that you're not a failure if you fail. You're a failure only when you quit. I've been telling my young people recently, I'm never down. I'm never down. I'm either up or I'm getting up, but I'm never down. We've got to face this thing. We've got to face this giant. We've got to stop worrying about failing and fail stop worrying about blowing it and give God an opportunity. I could tell you some major stories of how I failed recently. But probably the very first time I ever learned this lesson was when I was a, teen, a teenager. It's probably about 17, maybe 18 years old. And I had this burden for a, 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 a young man in our church who had been a good friend of mine and he backslid. And I hadn't seen him for a few months. And I remember I woke up one morning around 2 o'clock with, his, with, his, with him on my heart. And I was interceding for him and and this phone number came to my mind, Randall. This phone number came to my mind, and, and I didn't know Randy's phone number. And uh, this phone number just kept ringing through my mind, and I was praying, and 30 minutes went by, and I go, God, do you want me to ring this phone number? Oh, God, I, I, I just was impressed that Randy was there on the other line, and that if I would call, that he would get saved, because I had no way of getting a hold of him, and I prayed about it for half an hour. I prayed for 45 minutes. An hour went by. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. This phone number is going through my head. And I'm going, oh, God, you want me to call this phone number? And I go, okay, okay, Jesus. So I pick up the phone. And you know how guys are when they call a girl for the first time. You know, they just dial in. <laughs> you know, I did that a couple of times, you know. And finally I go, okay, Jesus, okay, okay, okay. So I dial the phone number and I let it ring. Ring. I was like, oh, Jesus, 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 ring. And I thought, oh, dear God, this guy is going to, I'm going to wake this guy up. He's going to chew me out, you know, ring. About the fourth ring, this old granny answers the phone. Hello. I said, uh, 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 this is Richard Crisco. Is, 
is Randy there? She goes, no. I said, I'm sorry. And I hung up. And I thought, you big failure. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Richard, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because you took a risk on the behalf of a friend that you loved. Jesus said, I don't look at you as a failure at all. At least you gave me a chance. And listen. And they may not seem like a very big thing, but let me tell you what, I'm learning more and more that if I'll step out of my comfort zone and if I'll face the giant, if I'll face the giant, that God will allow the courage and the boldness of the Lord to come up within me and give me victory after victory after victory. Listen to me, young people. It doesn't matter how much you shouted and danced and screamed and how wonderful a time you had this week. If you go home and you don't face this insecurity, if you don't face this fear factor, it's all in vain. It's all in vain. It's all in vain. I challenge you. The Lord said he's given you the city. The Lord said he's given you the land. He's not asking for your vote. He's not asking for your vote. He's asking for your obedience. Everybody stand. Father, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing this week. I believe, Lord, it's not in vain. But Lord, I ask that you give each of us a Holy Ghost courage to face the insecurities that even the greatest of youth pastors in this room struggle with. Father, help us to stop comparing ourselves with others. Help us to get our eyes off of the giants onto you. Help us, Lord, to guard our attitudes, our thoughts, our words, the way we speak about ourselves and think about ourselves. Help us, Lord, to have your mindset, Lord, to think on ourselves as you do. Lord, you said that we should not think more highly of ourselves. You didn't say we shouldn't think highly, just not more highly. I ask, Lord, that you would raise our opinions and our thoughts about ourselves. Lord, give us that warrior spirit to conquer, Lord, and to see victory brought to our school. Lord, what happened in Carrie and Brandon's school, I pray, will be multiplied a thousand times over this year in our schools across America. Father, I declare it, I speak it, it's the will of God in Jesus' name. Jesus' name.